Rutherford County. Mm-hmm. Ah, I yeah. know who you are. I'm oh, in. Who? Burke, I'm in Burke County. Okay. <laughs> so you're just. I heard uh, Tipa Snow in 2008 when I was a hospice volunteer. Oh. She came to hospice here, and I've been following her ever since. Yeah, she's she's amazing. Did you make it to our symposium? No, see, we had no power at that oh, point. So yeah. that was how I got your information because I sent a note and said, yeah. I missed the meeting. How can I, you know, get information? So yeah. they directed me to this meeting. Great, great. Well, and in fact, what Cheryl is going to be talking about tonight is a little bit different from what Tipa talked about. Yeah. So, so that's great. I'm a Stephen minister at oh, my church. Wonderful. And uh, we deal with, we do um, classes. We try to do a class every month on something different. And we just seem to keep coming back to memory loss and dementia. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have a lot of it here in this county. Yes. Well, sadly, all over. Yep. All over. Yeah. Yeah. My husband, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Um, my husband walked beside a friend um, that had Alzheimer's and walked with him for three and a half years on the journey. Once he got to the point he couldn't do his usual activities. And we went to the Alzheimer's support group here with Amy Hamilton. And that really prepared us for what was ahead of us. And it, I can't speak highly enough about these classes. Thank oh, you. Absolutely. absolutely. Well, we're glad you're here. Thank you. And that all of you are here. I'm sorry, Priscilla, this is Kevin Pierce. Uh, what county are you in? If you Rutherford County. Rutherford, wow, okay, thank you. Glad you're here. Yeah, I traveled a long way. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> and Priscilla, just so you know, um, Kevin works with hospice um, over in the Greensboro area. Oh, okay. Arthoracare. I can never pronounce that correctly. Mm -hmm. And you did it. It's Arthoracare. Right. Uh, it, it's a mouthful. Uh, patient and family are the author of their care. We're Hospice of Greensboro. Is who right. we really are. And I previously was uh, an in-home volunteer here at the Rutherford facility. Nice. Thank Great. you. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. Thank you. We have some others who have joined us. Hi, Stephanie. Hi, Deborah. Hi, David. David, David Reed. Hey, good evening, everyone. Hi, David. keep losing my screen. Oh my gosh, Deborah Love, how funny. Hmm. She says, thank you, I'm in Catawba County, but watching with my mom and dad, hmm. and I cannot speak, I dare not interrupt gum <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to um, Adult Children of Aging Parents, or ACAP. Uh, we are so glad to have you here this evening. Uh, tonight's program is an overview of Alzheimer's and other age-related dementias. My name is Bruce McReynolds, and I'm the chapter coordinator of the Adult Children of Aging Parents uh, chapter here in Gilbert County. Um, ACAP is one of um, several chapters who make up a national ACAP community. And although ACAP programs are specifically designed uh, for um, adult children who are caring for aging parents, um, our programs are open to everyone. Um, our programs are from a nationally validated and copyrighted uh, curriculum. Local community experts uh, present each of our programs. Our ACAP chapter is led by um, over 21 industry experts to select and validate the materials that um, you'll be seeing this evening and that are presented in all of our programs. Um, we invite you to join us uh, each month 
when we present a program on the third Thursday of each month at 7 p.m. So um, I hope that you'll join us for future ones as well. Our upcoming topics uh, next month in December will be an overview of residential options. Uh, in January, we'll talk about driving and aging. And then in February, we'll be looking at anxiety, depression, and aging. So um, we'd love to have you join us. If you would like to be notified of upcoming programs, uh, you can email us at acapgilford at gmail.com. Uh, and perhaps Jennifer can put that in our chat box so you'll see the, the email that you can send your request to be added to our mailing list. You can also take advantage of our expert-led content um, in our podcast library. Uh, this can be found on acapcommunity.org. So our mission is to bring um, all of our program to you at oh. no cost. Uh, so in order to do this, we have some really wonderful organizations here in the community that have stepped up to sponsor our chapter on an annual basis as well as to um, help us with sponsoring our, our monthly programs. So we'd like to thank our annual sponsors uh, that, that uh, help support our activities all year long. Um, those sponsors being Providence Place, Griswold Home Care, and Mount Zion Baptist Church. So tonight's program is being brought to you by three uh, very special um, um, sponsors. Uh, AARP, Choice Care Navigators, and Greensboro AHEC, which stands for Area Health Education Center Program. So for over 60 years, <clears throat> AARP has advocated for the needs of Americans as they age. And today, more than one in five Americans, or 21%, are caregivers. Having provided care to an adult or a child with special needs, at some time in the past 12 months. AARP is honored to partner with ACAP Guilford County and other local organizations to provide education and support um, to all of our unpaid caregivers. If you'd like to learn more about AARP and their many initiatives, uh, you can visit them at www.aarp.org uh, slash North Dash Carolina. We'd also like to thank our sponsor, Choice Care Navigators, um, which is a geriatric care management agency. Uh, they specialize in helping adult children of aging parents by offering a stress-free, one-stop shop to guide them through the caregiving journey. Uh, let their team of experts help you make decisions with more confidence, uh, connect you with appropriate resources, and reduce your stress and avoid common mistakes. We'd also like to thank um, Greensboro AHEC, um, which is A-H-E-C. It was established back in 1974 as part of a federally funded area health education centers program. They provide the support and education activities, services um, with a focus on primary care in rural communities uh, and those with less um, access to resources. The mission of Greensboro AHEC is to reduce, <clears throat> recruit, train, and retain the healthcare workforce needed to create a healthier North Carolina, including an eight county Piedmont region in which they serve. Access to resources. <clears throat> so um, thank you to all of our sponsors, um, especially for um, those that are um, uh, making tonight possible. So if you have any questions throughout our program tonight, we would invite you to put them in the chat box located in the lower left-hand corner of your screen. Uh, we'll collect those questions and um, we'll answer those at the end of the presentation. <clears throat> so before we introduce our speaker, I'd like to take a moment to recognize each of you who are family and professional caregivers. Uh, the objective, um, uh, some of you may not know or that November is the National Family Caregivers Month. And so the objective of National Caregivers uh, Month aligns perfectly with ACAP's mission, which is to raise awareness of caregiver issues, educate communities, 
and increased support for caregivers. The national theme this year is caregiving in crisis, um, highlighting new realities that family caregivers and their loved ones face during these uncertain times. Families are the primary source of support for older adults and people with disabilities in the US. Many caregivers work and also provide care um, and experiencing conflicts between competing responsibilities. Research indicates that caregiving also takes a significant emotional, physical, and financial toll. Nearly half of all caregivers over age 50, many are vulnerable to the decline in their own health. So studies have shown that coordinated support services can reduce caregiver depression, anxiety, and stress, and enable them to provide care longer, which avoids or delays the need for costly institutional care. So each of our ACAP chapters um, work year round to engage, support, and empower caregivers. So from all of our ACAP chapters across the country, um, I'd like to just express a heartfelt thank you uh, for all you do as a family caregiver and a professional caregiver. So let's jump into our topic of tonight's program, um, overview of Alzheimer's and other related um, dementias. We're honored to have with us this evening, Dr. Cheryl Greenberg, um, owner of The Age Coach. Dr. Cheryl Greenberg is a life coach for seniors and their families who are in transition. With her guidance, clients are dealing with health issues and dementias. Uh, they develop understandings about physical and cognitive changes, um, how to be effective caregivers, and ways to navigate the feelings that arise with these illnesses. Clients who are planning new and um, active futures find it helpful to talk about their plan with her as well. Cheryl has a doctorate in educational gerontology and memory changes in older adults. She's worked and has taught at senior living communities and educational programs and at UNCG School of Education. So um, it's our pleasure to um, introduce Cheryl. Cheryl, welcome. Thank you. I'm so glad to be here. Um, I'm going to share my screen if I can get this to happen. There we go. So as Bruce said, I work with older adults, particularly, I would say, um, with folks who are experiencing dementia, either themselves or in their families, or are concerned that perhaps they um, have an old, uh, a dementia diagnosis on the way. It is the, it is the uh, most prevalent reason why people come to see me, though there are other reasons for that. So tonight, I want to address some of the things that are on people's minds when they when they come to to talk with me, and I'm guessing that that's why you're here as well. First of all, I want to be really sure that we're clear about what's normal and what's dementia related, and the changes we see in our memories. So we'll we'll talk about that a little bit, and then some specific dementias. I mean, what are the signs and the stages of dementia. How does a, what does a dementia look like? And if there is a diagnosis of a dementia, what can be done about it? Are there treatments? Are there responses that make sense? And um, I hope we'll have time to talk about some healthy habits that will keep dementias um, at bay a bit keep our minds and brains um, resilient anyway. So let's dive in. Let's look first at, so something's going on, is it normal or is it a dementia? This is a question for you. Do you ever say, have you said recently, oh my, I forgot and said to yourself quietly, is this normal? Or is it a change that I should be concerned about? For example, and again, just, just try to uh, answer these questions for yourself for a moment. Have you run into someone recently who looked familiar, but you didn't remember his or her name? 
Have you misplaced anything this week? Where did you find it? What have you forgotten? And most importantly, how did you feel when you forgot? Well, here's the deal. It is uh, perfectly reasonable, perfectly expected to forget some things. In fact, when we look at what people forget, names and faces and even words are probably the most frequent complaints that we hear. But we sometimes forget things that are just routine. You know, you're just in the middle of cooking something in the kitchen or um, maybe trying to record something from your TV. You've done it a hundred times and right now it's just not coming to you. Normal, natural. Uh, we frequently forget TV shows, movies, books we've read. You know, you, you read a really great book, you put it down, you call somebody to tell them about it, you haven't a clue what the name of the book is. You can remember eventually, but um, that, that happens a lot. Directions, someplace, that's not unusual. And the thing that is most annoying is putting something down like your keys and not having any idea where they are. These are normal changes. Actually, we um, remember best we even have our best problem-solving thinking skills by the time we're in our 40s and 50s. Our memory, to you, to, uh, our memory and our ability to process information, to think, to problem-solve, all decline slowly over time. Not so that it's noticeable day-to-day -day or week-to-week, -week, but when you look back, uh, 10 years ago or 20 years ago, you probably noticed that you're having a little more trouble remembering things than you did uh, back then. So why is this? Well, in general, there are changes to our brain. In general, our nervous system slows down. It just takes longer to remember something for our brains to process that, oh my goodness, I'd like to know this, find it in your brain and get the information back out again. It takes longer because our central nervous system slows down. You know, if uh, you see this in reaction time, it as you get older, it takes longer to hit the brake when something happens when you're driving, right? It's a reason why we have to be more cautious about driving as we get older. This kind of um, slowed reaction is barely noticeable day to day, but it is a, probably the major reason why we have more trouble remembering things and putting together information so that we can problem solve. There's also a, some thinking, which is a little more controversial, that says that we simply have more to remember. You know, we've got a brain that's sort of like a file cabinet full of information, which some of which we've put into our brain in nice orderly ways. Like you may be an expert on Civil War history. So everything you remember about Civil War history um, is sort of connected and organized. You'll remember that better when you're, you'll be able to talk about it better and get the memories back out better than some information that you randomly put in your brain that's not connected to other things, such as the name of that book that you just put read and put down. Our memories are also always affected by things like medication, stress, illness, just the ordinary demands day to day. There's also something called mild cognitive impairment. Again, it's not a disease process. Uh, it sort of is a skirts the issue of what's normal and what's disease. So we don't call it a dementia. We don't call it a disease. But it involves more significant problems with memory 
than just the ordinary changes. It's enough memory change that we really do notice it. People around us notice we're having trouble remembering. And it may even interfere with some of the tasks we're trying to accomplish. It's not a dementia, and I'll tell you why in a minute. These kinds of changes are the result of some changes in our brain, and they can involve language and attention and problem solving uh, at a more significant le level than we would expect from normal memory changes. About uh, 30 to 50 percent of these people, of these mild cognitive impairments, uh, develop into a dementia. The number keeps changing. It's not clear exactly how many of them. But for some people, this is a precursor to a dementia. For most people, it's just an annoying fact of life. So we have normal memory changes. We have mild cognitive impairment. And now for a dementia. The, de the definition is really important. A dementia is a general term. It's what I'd call an umbrella term. It's a general term for a whole lot of different diseases that involve an impairment of brain function and um, negative impacts on one's ability to carry out the activities of daily living. Let me say that a little bit differently. Dementia is the term for a lot of diseases, maybe hundreds of diseases, depending on which scientist you talk to. It in, uh, the diseases in some way interfere with brain function and affect our ability to live independently, to carry out the activities of daily living, like grooming, planning meals, eating, just taking care of business. Now, in this gray area are things we call reversible dementias. Reversible dementia, by definition, means that, um, involves some kind of condition that can be treated. And when you treat that condition, the person's ability to function, for their brains to function well, improves. Maybe it's completely uh, back to normal. There are all kinds of things that you to cause that cause irreversible that cause reversible dementias, illnesses, for example. You ever have flu and you just feel like you cannot remember things. You don't want to deal with problems. You feel foggy headed. But once the flu is gone, you're back to yourself. You don't even remember the problems you were having. It could be a tumor. Depression is one of those uh, dis one of those disorders. One of those problems that really impairs memory and other thinking skills. Again, medication um, can be a problem. You know, a single medication, whether it's over the counter or something that's prescribed can have a really significant impact on, on how well our brains function. There are um, lists uh, that pharmacists and doctors have and that you can find on the internet that will tell you what the impact of a given medication is on uh, memory, for example. And of course, drug interactions can, can magnify the problem. But here's one I'll bet you haven't thought about. Oh, I don't know, at least I didn't for a long time. And that is diet and hydration, diet and taking in adequate fluids. My mother had Alzheimer's disease, but when she was still able to function really well, she would, from time to time, call me and sound really confused. At which point, I would call my brother, who lived near her, and say, Mom's not drinking enough. He would make sure she got fluids, and her confusion would lift. Uh, but, uh, so having adequate, di good diets and adequate hydration can be awfully important. And then there are just all kinds of other things, from the stresses of life to um, alcohol use, drug use, and so forth. And now for the dementias that are not reversible, by definition, they involve brain function like memory, thinking, and behavior changes. 
They, by definition, mean that a person has difficulty carrying out the activities of daily living. The changes can also include anything that is controlled by the brain, which is really everything we do. It can involve communication and motor skills, even breathing and walking. And by definition, dementias are almost always, almost always progressive and fatal. They are not normal. So uh, they are not, uh, when I say they're not normal, that means they're not inevitable. While the risk increases with age, it is not the case that just because a person gets older, they develop a dementia. And that's important to keep in mind because sometimes the people around us say when, you, when a person can't remember well, well, what do you expect? You're getting older. We need to know if a person is just having normal memory changes or um, in fact, they're dealing with a dementia. Dementias are due to damage in the brain in some specific area of damage to the brain. So this is sort of what dementia looks like in um, some kind of graphic way. There are all kinds of dementias, as I said. However, with each of these trees representing a different dementia, the most prevalent uh, dementia is Alzheimer's disease. 60 to 80% of diagnoses of dementia are Alzheimer's disease diagnoses, 60 to 80%. One out of three people who's 85 years old or older has Alzheimer's disease. Five million people in the United States have Alzheimer's disease. Um, we're going to talk about a couple of the other dementias, though, as well as Alzheimer's. One is vascular dementia, and about 10% of people who have a diagnosis of dementia have vascular dementia. Five to 15% have Lewy body dementia, and that number is really wide, probably because it's such a hard um, disease to diagnose still. Frontotemporal is about number four in the list for poor frequency. And then there's something called mixed dementia, and that means that a person has two or more dementia, uh, dementia diagnoses at the same time. Typically, it's vascular and Alzheimer's or Lewy body and Alzheimer's. But I don't want to ever let go of the idea and the fact that many of us have memory problems and they are not dementia. There are our green trees. So how does a, a dementia happen? I like to think about the brain as sort of a road map. If I wanted to go, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but if I were going from this uh, left-hand side of the map, and trying to go all the way to the right-hand side of the map. I would just follow these roads and uh, go up uh, one road and down another through intersections, and I'd eventually get to my destination, right? You've been seeing in some of my slides a picture that you may or may not have recognized. It looks sort of like that, and that's a brain cell. That's a neuron, and every neuron has a little bit of responsibility for some brain function. For example, if I'm trying to remember my nephew's birthday, I'm going to, um, one neuron in my brain is going to fire up and do some small part, some small part of remembering his birthday. But actually, it's going to take tons, thousands. We have 100,000, 100, no, that's the wrong, uh, brain cells. And they're all, they interconnect to form a pathway or one of these roads, one of these roads to remember a birthday, to remember how to turn the toaster on. Ultimately, the brain cells sort of interconnect, send messages to each other, and form each memory or each um, problem-solving task we do. Now, here's the thing. If one of these brain cells is damaged, it interrupts the connections between them. Just as on the road, if we were trying to go from here way up to the northeast corner here, 
and there was a pothole, we'd have a little more trouble getting there, wouldn't we? But if there were, if the road was completely blocked off, we'd have to take some detours and we can do that in our brain. If we can't remember one way, we can try another path. But if there are enough potholes and breaks uh, and, and um, interruptions in the road, eventually we can't find another way to get there. If there are enough breaks in the pathway or the road, we uh, lose the memory. And we have essentially, I'm sorry, uh, we have essentially um, loss of brain mass. The brain has um, shrinks in size and loses its ability to communicate among neurons. This happens um, in all of the dimensions, but I want to ask you first just to think for a moment about some of the things that you seen in people who have a dementia? What are some of the signs that you've seen that look like change, that look like some of a person's having trouble with brain pathways? In other words, they're not able to remember or problem solve. Did you see symptoms change? Did you see changes in their ability to do things? Were there any treatments for those changes? That's what we're going to talk about now. Some people think that there are hundreds, uh, as I said before, think that there are hundreds of types of dementia. Uh, I don't want to go in right now into how those things are counted, but I will tell you that each of the dementias has similarities and differences. This is a very simple version of what the brain looks like. What's important to notice here is that different parts of the brain have different major responsibilities, different major tasks. So for example, right here in this yellow area, deep in this yellow area, is the primary center for memory. In the red area is where we see um, problem solving, judgment, decision making. Over here in the blue area, we're going to see a lot, of, we're going to see language. The responsibility for language is up there. So in fact, if there's damage to these areas, what's going to happen? If there's damage to the memory area, we're going to have trouble remembering. Same thing with the area where we make judgments and process information. And the same thing for language. Alzheimer's disease affects all of these areas. Eventually, Alzheimer's disease can affect many other parts of the brain, but these are the ones that we typically see pretty early on. So difficulty with memory is um, the leading indicator, if you will, the thing that people notice first. But we will also see difficulty making decisions, planning, problem solving, even having poor judgment. We worry a lot about people who have Alzheimer's disease being uh, early on being subject to scams, for example. You know, somebody comes to the driveway and says, wow, you know, there's a crack in your driveway and the police are coming tomorrow to find you, but I can fix it today if you give me $600. And the person says, oh my goodness, yes, go ahead and fix it. That's an example of some problems, often some problems, uh, you know, with, pro with decision making and using information and making a good judgment. So that's not always an Alzheimer's diagnosis, but as an example, if a person has Alzheimer's, that might happen. People with Alzheimer's pretty early on start to show that they have trouble doing things that were familiar to them in the past. For example, uh, Sam might always have kept the books and for the family, you know, sort of balance the checkbook. And now he sits down to balance the checkbook and he's just confused about what the first step is. Just can't get started. We certainly see with Alzheimer's disease that damage to the memory area, to the communication area, and so people begin to forget words not be able to recover them, not understand what's 
being said to them, and that progressively gets worse over time. This one is a little bit more confusing if we're not familiar with it. It, it involves sort of being aware of time and place. We take this for granted. We know what five o'clock means, right? We just know. We know what summer means and we respond to that by wearing appropriate clothes and doing appropriate activities. But time and place start to lose their meaning so that a person who has Alzheimer's disease may dress inappropriately for the season and not, not even begin to understand why it's inappropriate. They may uh, put something down, forget where they put it, and remember the car keys in one of my first slides. We all do that, but we can retrace our steps. One of the signs of Alzheimer's disease is the inability to retrace the steps. There's confusion with space, space um, and visual information, and, and what that means uh, is that it's hard to interpret what we see. So it comes very naturally to us to, to understand that things are three-dimensional, right? A person with Alzheimer's disease may fall because they don't quite get that there is a great deal of space between here and where they're trying to go. Or they lean over to pick something up and mis, um, misjudge where they're reaching to. This becomes a problem early on when, when a person is still driving, right? You have to understand space to drive safely. Changes in mood and personality are the opposite of the first two on this page because on this slide, because we don't think much about time and place and spatial relationships, but there is a great deal of myth around changes in mood and personality. People say, oh, everybody who has Alzheimer's disease becomes um, belligerent, paranoid, or that's not at all the case. Some people become more um, difficult, more aggressive. Some people become more passive, compliant, what we might call sweet. Some people don't have significant memory or personality changes. It depends a lot on um, where damage in the brain is. And it makes a lot of sense that people who have Alzheimer's disease are going to withdraw from many of the activities they usually took part in, partly because uh, they can't do those activities and partly because the world has become confusing and it's just really hard to sit at a Thanksgiving table with a bunch of people who are talking and you're not understanding what's going on. Alzheimer's disease has a fairly a smooth, if you will, consistently changing pattern of development, but it, there may be sudden changes for some people and the, the rate of change and the exact, um, the specific changes are different from one person to the other. But we can talk about it broadly. And so I will very quickly tell you that in the early stages, you're going to see some, there are going to be warning signs that I spoke of with space problems and language and thinking and memory. But typically, by definition, a person who's in the earlier mild stages needs some cues, some help, maybe some labels on, on things, uh, maybe more reminder notes, but they can function. Middle stage, by definition, person's ability to think and remember and use language decreasing significantly and the person needs a great deal more help managing their day-to-day -day activities. This person is going to have to have a great deal of help with meals and with communication and so forth. And again, by definition, when we see somebody who has very, very limited communication, has trouble walking, getting out of bed on their own, getting to a chair, having trouble perhaps eating solid foods, uh, this person's in the late or severe stages of dementia. So, vascular dementia. 
And you notice maybe that the arrows are exactly going to the exactly the same places that I mentioned for Alzheimer's disease. Is it the same disease? Not at all. First of all, vascular dementia um, has to do with insufficient blood getting to the parts of the brain that it needs to get to. You know, every time our heart beats, 25% of that blood that it's pumping, it go goes to the brain. The brain needs the blood flow to take nutrition and oxygen to the blood and to take away waste products. But when we have vascular dementia, the places where um, the damage occurs depends on where the um, veins and arteries are damaged. Typically, we think about strokes, right? And it will depend on if, it's, if a person has a stroke and there's damage to the brain, we need to know where the damage happens. And so the damage can be in any part of the brain. It can involve um, movement. It can involve sight. Um, just a, a, so you see overlap with Alzheimer's disease, you also see difficult uh, differences. There can be difficulty with memory, decision making, judgment, communication, and other activities, just as with Alzheimer's, but it's going to depend on where the damage happens. While we see a sort of steady progression with Alzheimer's disease, vascular dementia is much more sudden and followed by a plateau. So if somebody has a major stroke, to use the popular language, you may see within a period of some weeks or, mo or a month or two, you may see some real change in what the person's capable of doing. They may recover some of that loss of function in their brain um, but pretty much there's damage done and you know where it is and it stops there unless there's another stroke. Multi-infarct dementia is similar, but it's a series typically of mini strokes. And so you see something that looks a little bit like a staircase. There's a little stroke, there's some damage some in the brain, and then the person plateaus, nothing changes. But if another, when another mini stroke comes along, when another uh, infarct comes along, there's a little more change in function and then another plateau. It looks like a series of steps as long as, the, um, as, as, long as these um, uh, little strokes are happening, these mini strokes are happening. Let's look at one more. Let's look at Lewy body. Um, and I pick Lewy body because, as I said, it's the one that is one of the diseases that's very hard to diagnose still. Like all the other diseases, it can involve the same three place parts of the brain, but uh, it can really involve all parts of the brain. And what's significant about Lewy body in making the distinction between it and Alzheimer's disease is that the signs are very different. They, at least they come in a different order than they come in uh, Alzheimer's disease. So sure, there can be memory loss and problems with thinking, but they're typically a little later in the disease where they're the leading symptoms in Alzheimer's disease. What you're more likely to see early on is aggression, anxiety, sort of personality or behavioral uh, problems, even depression. We see some movement difficulties like, that look like um, Parkinson's disease, and there is a relationship between Lewy body disease, uh, dementia, and Parkinson's disease. So stiffness, a, a, a difficulty with walking, tremors. Sleep disturbances are things that we see pretty early, and hallucinations and delusions are symptomatic of Lewy body disease. The interesting thing about Lewy body disease, from, at least for me, is, is that while the disease changes over time, it's unpredictable. So some symptoms may come, and then go, and then come back again. There's sort of an ebb and flow of the symptoms. 
And it is so different. The appearance of the symptoms and the pace of the change is so different from one person to another that probably the only way to talk about the progression of the disease is talk about the amount of help a person needs. Does that make some sense to you? The more they need help with, or a person needs help with the activities of daily living, the further along they are in the disease. This is a disease that is often misdiagnosed or missed. And people will say the person has Alzheimer's disease and they don't, they have Lewy bus. So I think I can anticipate your question. So how do we fix these things? I'm not going to go deeply into this, but I will tell you that we are not in a position to fix, to treat, in significant ways to stop or cure any of these dementias right now. There's some things we can do. There are medications that help with the symptoms for a while. They don't slow the disease down, but they do dampen down the symptoms. Somebody may think or remember a bit better if they take these medications. They work for some people some of the time. So we are we're still away from really being able to get in the middle of this disease and make things significantly better. You may be familiar with things uh, with, with medications like Aricept, which is used for Alzheimer's disease in Lewy body, uh, Nemenda, which is used for Alzheimer's typically, uh, Cinemet is one of the medications that's used for, um, for Lewy body. Some people use um, medications off label to deal with anxiety and depression and those kinds of conditions, although that's pretty controversial. And if that's brought up to you, I would personally suggest that you have really clear conversations with the doctor about them. And of course, there are things that you can do more directly. Remember when I said almost all diseases, almost all dementias um, are progressive and fatal. Well, there's Think about vascular dementia, which is caused by problems um, that have underlying conditions like diabetes and cholesterol and high blood pressure. We do have ways, doctors do have ways of treating those conditions, which may be an aid in at least stopping the progression of vascular dementia, preventing the next stroke. But for the others that I talked about, there is nothing that really changes the course of the disease. So really, um, what do we do? You've seen, let's say you've seen signs, uh, you've got concerns, you really uh, want to know if this is a dementia. I would suggest you think about this uh, in terms of the PQRST of dealing with dementia an easy way to remember it. The P stands for prepare and question. And I'll tell you the truth, I have a bit of a soapbox about this. Um, because I really, really encourage people to be sure that they find a doctor and they go to a doctor for a thorough medical checkup. But that when, this is the soapbox part, I believe it's very important to find a doctor who is comfortable dealing with dementias, who's very knowledgeable about dealing with dementias, and um, a person you feel comfortable asking questions. To go, I would certainly suggest that uh, if you're seeing signs, you keep a little log, you write down the kinds of signs that you're seeing, that you're concerned about, so that you can take it to the doctor. The doctor should do a thorough physical and a thorough history. Look at all the medications. Remember, this could be a reversible dementia, right? It could be an illness or a tumor or um, as I, a, something as common as a urinary tract infection. We want to have a really good workup. The doctor may recommend a neurologist or a psychological evaluation. We want to rule out, for example, a depression which can be a reversible dementia. And um, 
I'm sorry, I don't remember if I just said that, but if I did, medications are, it's very important the doctor take, have a good understanding of what the medications are that the person is taking. And then because you have a doctor who you can talk to, you wanna have a clear conversation about, so why do you think this is the diagnosis? And, and what's coming up in the future? What do you expect is going to happen? And what are the ways that we can respond to this? Are there any treatments? So P and Q are for prepare and question. The R is for review of readiness. I, I just think that you, this is the time in the early diagnosis when you have to address what I call the nitty gritty. I mean, this is the legal stuff and the financial stuff. You, if you wait, if a person waits too long, they won't be able to sign their own will. They won't be able to express their uh, right, sign a power of attorney. They won't be able, let me say it more positively. If you talk to the person early on, the person with the dementia making plans can participate. They can say, hey, as time moves on, this is how I want to be taken care of. This is where I want to live. This is what I want to do in the time that I have to be able to continue to be um, engaged in life and having a good time. So do the nitty gritty, the legal and, and uh, financial stuff, but also plan to really see the best in the days that you have. The S stands for seek support, seek support. Um, I, you know, if you're a caregiver, that there is a, a lot of responsibility, a lot of pressure sometimes, a lot of feelings, and often a great need for information. Well, the information is out there. You're at a meeting tonight with the Adult Children of Aging Parents with ACAP. We have, as you saw, uh, we have education programs regularly. And in your communities, there are lots of other opportunities for information as well. For example, uh, I'm in Greensboro and Senior Resources at Guilford, the community centers, and many other, many other um, agencies and organizations offer education. There are professional organizations for each of the dementias that I already talked about. They, of course, have specialized information. Seek them out. Seek their support. Seek support groups, other people who are going through the same things that you're going through. And of course, there are individuals um, who you can uh, talk to one-on-one, -on -one, dementia caregivers, social workers, people like me who do coaching. Don't be alone in this process. And the T stands for tackle your role. And what I mean by that is really embrace it. Have open conversations uh, with uh, others in your circle, whether it's with the patient, the person who has the dementia, with family members, with friends. Share how you're feeling. Seek support. Ask people who may not understand that you need support. Ask them for what you need. Ask them for time off, for time when you can... We, you know, you can recuperate, you can de-stress, you can have some moments to yourself. Talk, uh, acknowledge that there are changes and that there are going to be some feelings that of sadness, feelings of uh, frustration. But most of all, most of all, focus on and enjoy the possible. You can focus on the losses. They, are, they can be very sad. But you can also appreciate and enjoy what you do have in the day, what you do have at this time. And I am actually going to stop there and see if we have questions. Carol, we do have a question. Um, actually, a few. One of them is, that after a brain aneurysm, is there an associated dementia typically? 
it is an assault to the brain. Uh, just uh, and absolutely, there can be um, there can be damage to the brain that would impair a person's ability to function and carry out the activities of daily living. Depends on where the damage is and how severe the damage. Thank you. Can you also speak to the impact of sleep with dementia? There are a lot of, yes, um, there are a lot of risk factors for dementia. And uh, of course, I'll speak generally, but you know, it, there's going to be a lot of variation from one dementia to another. Certainly sleep apnea, is that what you said, sleep apnea, Jennifer? I think sleep patterns and amounts and interruptions in general? Yes. Uh, we do need to have adequate sleep for, uh, for healthy brains. Um, our brains do a lot of sort of repairing themselves while we're asleep and also strengthening our memory while we sleep. We want, so absolutely sleep um, is one of the factors we want to look at. In fact, um, I'll show you, let me show you this little list for healthy, healthy bodies and healthy brains. So I, I didn't write sleep on there for some reason, but all of these factors um, make our body stronger, healthier, and our brains are part of our body. So we wanna get adequate exercise, eat well, maintain good physical health, which includes medical checkups, work on emotional health, get those stress levels down. Um, chronic stress is very bad for our bodies and for our brains. Uh, we want to manage things like minimizing alcohol, eliminating smoking, and actively using our brains all the time. And did you see the one that says socialization? Socializing, being in contact with people may be, having good caring relationships may actually be the number one factor in health and longevity and health and long life. I'll talk about that more if we have a moment, but if not, ask me another question, Jennifer. And we've got another good one. Um, how should someone start the conversation with a loved one about the possibility of having dementia or getting them to go to the doctor for an evaluation? I wish there were a really good, quick answer to that. There are good answers to that, but not quick ones. Um, because it depends oh so much on what your relationship is with the person, how open a relationship you can have, how much this is in a relationship where you can talk nitty gritty easily. It also depends a lot on the person who has the symptom willingness to address a dementia. So um, Alzheimer's Association takes a very, very clear stand saying that as soon as there are signs and symptoms, you should sit down and have a, that you see as the person, not the person with the dementia, but as soon as you see this in somebody else, that you sit down and have this frank conversation. And the fact of the matter is that not everybody wants to know and can deal with knowing if they have a dementia. But in general, you want to um, set a, um, so these are very general answers for a very complex <clears throat> question, right? But in general, you want to find safe times to speak, quiet times to have conversations. You want to be ready to have the conversation repeatedly over a period of time until everybody adjusts to the possibility of a dementia. Um, it's a, it is often a slow process where people have to deal with uh, fear and sadness and ways to cope. Um, we don't discuss, we won't probably have a program on this in, in the near future. But I will tell you that there are uh, some really good resources in the community, including Alzheimer's Association, to look at how to have those conversations. 
Dr. Greenberg, thank you so much for um, being with us this evening and for your presentation. I know I, I learned a lot and I'm sure those that um, were in the, in the group here learned a lot as well. So thank you for bringing all this uh, education to us. My pleasure. If you'd like to reach out to um, Dr. Greenberg, you can reach her at um, the, the age coach at gmail.com. You can also visit her website at theagecoach.net. So uh, I'm sure she'd be more than happy to um, answer any additional questions that you might have um, after this program. Um, again, we'd like to thank our sponsors for this evening, um, AARP, Choice Care Navigators, and Area Health Education Centers Program, or AHEC of Greensboro. We appreciate uh, them bringing um, this program to us this evening. Uh, we would in invite each of you to join us again next month. Um, our program in December will be on the 17th at 7 p.m. Uh, it will be <clears throat> overview of residential options. Uh, our presenter will be Dr. Corinne Allman. So um, if you'd like <clears throat> to receive, again, those invites, to our programs, you can email us at acapgilford at gmail.com. Uh, you can also visit our website at acapgilford.org. So again, um, we appreciate everyone being here and, and hope that you found it uh, uh, helpful and look forward to having you join us again next month.